sure that members of the audience will find this striking, but I encourage them to hang on and we'll explain and we'll talk about it. There's no solid evidence that carbohydrates cause diabetes. Insulin induced insulin resistance is a fairy tale. What would be the reason then for people to have diabetes and insulin resistance? What's causing that if it's not from carbohydrates? You ever heard the name Dr. Paul Saladino? Dr. Paul Saladino. Dr. Paul Saladino, MD. He's a double board certified medical doctor. Certified functional medicine practitioner. And he eats a carnivore diet. The doctor who says you don't have to eat your vegetables. He also has a book called Carnivore Code. And then he quit the carnivore diet. I felt a lot better in every way. I had better sleep, more libido, my testosterone went up, less heart fluttering. Certainly in the carnivore community, there are people who claim to be outliers and claim to not have issues with this. If you check their body temperature, it's going to be low. You won't die, but I don't think it leads to optimal health in humans. It becomes, in the most respectful way, I'll say a race to the bottom. I kind of want to push back a little bit. Sure. One of the reasons why I don't eat as many carbohydrates, and this might sound crazy. Even if you are diabetic, even if you have insulin resistance, some amount of carbohydrates is going to benefit you. Oh, I'm addicted to carbohydrates. And if I eat carbohydrates, I can't stop eating carbohydrates. And I think we need to realize that though someone is trying to limit sugars, quote unquote, to lose weight, that they're handicapping themselves and you're limiting your long-term ability to really be fully healthy or your hormones affected negatively when the thyroid declines as it will. My health completely changed with the help of Dr. Paul Saladino. He was one of the first doctors who I listened to on YouTube for nutrition advice. I've watched him evolve from super strict zero carb carnivore to a little bit of honey, to a little bit of fruit, to now a lot more fruit and doing 300 to 400 grams of carbs a day. It has been so fun watching him evolve. Over the years, I've personally made adjustments to my diet and I've changed my views on food because of Dr. Paul Saladino. So I say this with a lot of respect for him. We agree on 90% of things, but we do disagree on certain topics. And so you'll see me push back on certain things that he says throughout this video, and you'll see him also question me. And I think it's really good to have these discussions, different perspectives, stay open-minded. Though I will say that while I disagreed with small things that were said, there was one bigger thing that I just thought could be misinterpreted. And both he and I are on the same goal of trying to help people. And so I just thought that I could give more clarification and perspective with one of the things that he said. And I'll talk more about that at the end of the video. If you enjoy the conversation, give it a thumbs up. And I left links to all of Dr. Paul Saladino's social media handles in the description. Paul, mi primera pregunta es si vives en Costa Rica, hablas español? <laughs> Yo vivo en Costa Rica ahorita. I do. I, I had Spanish in high school and then I took like two semesters in college. In college, I spent a summer in Costa Rica at a hospital on the east coast of Costa Rica in Limon. So I was 19 or something. And yeah, I spent a summer at this hospital and they they said, how old are you? And I said, 19. And they said, oh, so you're in, your, you're in your second or third year of medical school. And I said, I'm in my second or third year of college. I said, oh, it's the same thing. Why don't you suture this guy up and here, deliver this baby. And I didn't know what I was doing, but they they helped me figure it out. So that was, yeah, a strange time. Wow. And, then, and then I've retained some of the Spanish. And since being in Costa Rica for the last two and a half years, I, it's kind of fun to play around with the language and hear things. Yeah, for sure. Well, like I said, I grew up in San Diego, 45 minutes from Mexico. So it's like all of my friends, all the people around, they, they all spoke Spanish. So you kind of had to learn growing up in middle school. They taught us how to speak Spanish. So it's kind of like I dream now in Spanish. Don't I'm like, why do I still have this, even though I don't practice it anymore? Hmm. I think it's good for the human brain to learn languages. Huh. I think it's fun. Yeah. So related to food. If you could only pick three foods to eat for the rest of your life, and they have to be foods that are gonna sustain you and keep you living the longest, what three foods would those be? Um, I'm a pretty huge fan of heart. So I think if you had to choose an organ, you can eat, I'm pretty sure you can eat almost all the heart you want. So I'd, I'd eat heart, I'd want probably milk and maybe some source of carbohydrates something like uh, oranges. Okay. So that's interesting that you mentioned some form of carbohydrates because my biggest form of carbohydrates is milk. Okay. Now I do have some fruit, but most of my carbs are coming from milk and then yogurt, so dairy. Uh -huh. would, would the milk not be enough carbs for you? And why do you need more carbs with an orange or another piece of fruit? Um, so milk is lactose, which is a disaccharide of glucose and galactose. I actually think there are some benefits to having fructose in your diet, despite the, the bad rap that it gets, especially in food form. 
And I think that there are unique nutrients in oranges that I'm not going to get in the milk. And I think, yeah, milk probably wouldn't be enough carbohydrates for me. If people know my story, I was, let's just say strict carnivore for about a year and a half, give or take, at which time I wrote my first book, the scary, interesting, challenging thing about writing a book is you sort of freeze your thoughts in kryptonite. They're not very living or dynamic, which I don't think is the way that our thoughts and ideas should be. So there are a lot of things in the book that I agree with still, but some things in the first book that I would probably evolve on. So after about a year and a half, give or take, on strict carnivore meat, organs, fat, and salt only, zero cheat days, um, there were benefits. My eczema got a lot better, but there were a lot of negatives, especially toward the end, that I think were related to long-term electrolyte imbalances, related to probably persistently low insulin. And we can talk about that as well. And so at that point, I reincorporated some carbohydrates into my diet. Believe me, it was traumatic because I really believed that meat and organs and animal foods were all that I needed. And I think they were pretty close. I think you can get a lot of benefits from meat and organs and they're obviously incredibly nutrient rich. But when I included carbohydrates first as honey and then as fruit into my diet, I felt a lot better in every way. I had better sleep, more libido, my testosterone went up less palpitations, so heart fluttering, um, more able to exercise. So at that time, my exercise was either in a climbing gym or in the ocean surfing. And in both of those activities, I was getting muscle cramps. So all sorts of things got better when I included carbohydrates. So I think that for me, a lot of things feel better with carbohydrates. And then as I've learned more about this, I think that there's a lot of good literature to suggest that I think everyone's experience is individual and not to be discounted, but um, I think there's a lot of literature to suggest that humans do better with carbohydrates and more than you would just get from drinking milk. I mean, so how many carbohydrates do you think you get a day from lactose in the milk that you're drinking? Like 50 grams. Yeah, I think you'd do better. I think most humans would do better with more carbohydrates than that. That's well, just from zero. the milk. So I probably do like 75 most days because with the yogurt and then the piece of fruit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would, I would want more than that probably. Okay. So what would you suggest? I'm five foot, two inches tall, about 115 uh, pounds. I do work out. What would you suggest for someone like me? So I think that, and again, there's a lot of nuance here, right? There's an asterisk in this statement and I'll qualify the asterisk in a moment, but I think that for most humans, hundred grams is kind of the minimum of carbohydrates, especially if you're working out a lot, maybe even more. So I'm five, nine, 165 pounds, and I probably eat, and again, I'm, I'm sure that members of the audience will find this striking, but I encourage them to, to hang on and we'll explain and we'll talk about it. So I work out a lot, meaning for me that I get in the ocean every day and surf because it's my joy and it's the reason I live in Costa Rica for probably two to two and a half hours. And I have easily over 300 grams of carbohydrates a day. I'm often at 400 grams of carbs a day from milk, fruit, and honey. And with that, I've seen no negative effects looking at labs and my gut doesn't have an issue with it, which is relative to the asterisk that we talked about. I think that it's just, it, it gives your body a signal of abundance. And we see that in various enzymatic processes throughout the body, glutathione metabolism, thyroid hormones, which are super important as kind of a, a gauge of what your body is looking at, basal body temperature, which I think a lot of people don't check enough or have a sense of what their actual metabolism is doing. And all of those things improve for me when I have more carbohydrates. My sleep is better. My energy is better. My endurance is better. My strength is better. My recovery is better. And again, I'm, I'm on the, I say upper end of activity because I'm in the ocean. It's a warm ocean, but I'm in the ocean every single day. But I think that for most people, at least hundred grams of carbohydrates are, are beneficial. Now the asterisk is that some people don't tolerate sources of carbohydrates because of underlying things in their guts. I've definitely spoken to people who have what clinically sounds like some sort of dysbiosis, also known as small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO, though I don't think that that term is particularly accurate. So I think that if people have persistent pervasive dysbiosis and they try and include fruit and honey, they may have issues because the gut is kind of disordered. And sometimes you have to fix the gut before you can do those sorts of carbohydrates. Now, the other thing I'll say is that I really think if you look at the literature, there's no solid evidence that carbohydrates cause diabetes. This is really, really important to understand that I 
will strongly state that insulin induced insulin resistance is a fairy tale. There's no such thing as insulin induced insulin resistance outside of a lab, outside of a direct infusion of insulin into a vein. I do not buy this theory that more carbohydrates increases insulin and your body becomes insulin insulin resistant because of the insulin. That simply doesn't happen to any significant degree in humans that I've ever, ever seen. The problem for most people is that when they eat carbohydrates in the setting of insulin resistance, their management of those carbohydrates is dysregulated. And so it can be difficult. So I guess the second asterisk, the double asterisk is that if you are diabetic or you have massive amounts of insulin resistance, you can scale down the carbohydrates. But I still think that even if you are diabetic, even if you have insulin resistance, some amount of carbohydrates is going to benefit you. And it, there's really not solid evidence that it worsens your diabetes. So I'll pause there and we can come back to any of that that you want. Yeah, I have like 15 questions, but that's it. Um, I'm sure. <laughs> so one being that what would be the reason then for people to have diabetes and insulin resistance? What's causing that if it's not from carbohydrates? And then the other yeah. thing is, is there anybody who you would suggest to do like zero or even 50 or less carbs, depending on their health status, even for a brief period of time or still no? So there's a really interesting series of experiments from the 1950s and 1960s. Are you familiar with this guy named Dr. Walter Kempner and the rice diet? Have you heard of this? Uh -huh. So the compliance is very difficult when you go this low fat, but he fed people essentially white rice and table sugar. These were people who were morbidly obese. So you have overweight, obese, morbid obesity, depending on your BMI. And on a diet of rice and white sugar, predominantly, all of the patients that he puts on this diet lose significant amounts of weight. And the important part here is that their insulin resistance improves. So they resolve their diabetes while eating diets of almost exclusively carbohydrates. Now, the devil's in the details. They're also eating low fat. And when they liberalize their diet, the insulin resistance does not return. So they don't have insulin resistance when they liberalize their diet to some extent. Now, I'm not recommending this diet to anyone. Our brains and our hunger cues are wired to have I believe some people would debate this, some amount of protein. A lot of people can agree with a ballpark of like how much protein is important for humans, some amount of carbohydrates and some amount of fats. I think that if you eliminate the fats and you go too low fat, you're going to have issues. And this is probably anything below 20 to 25% of your calories from fat. You're going to see hormonal decline. You're going to see persistent hunger. You just don't feel good as a human with that low fat. And then if you eliminate the carbohydrates, I think that you also have problems in human physiology because you turn on stress hormones. So acutely you turn on things like epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, cortisol, and your thyroid hormones decline. And then chronically you will trigger glucagon, which is, I think you can make a very strong case that glucagon is a stress hormone and that's activated chronically in people who limit their carbohydrates. So what I'm saying is that humans tend to want to have some protein, some carbohydrates, and some fat. What Walter Kempner was doing was very low fat, lots of carbohydrates, pretty limited protein. What's interesting about this study is that the diabetes, the insulin resistance doesn't return when the diet is liberalized. And so I think what's going on here is that the composition of our cell membranes is, is dynamic and it's influenced by the fats that we eat. Linoleic acid is in a lot of seed oils. I've talked a lot about seed oils in my work. Linoleic acid particularly is a fat that accumulates in our body. And I think that linoleic acid, because it accumulates in our membranes, is probably one of these signaling molecules that evolutionarily triggered us to enter states like hibernation, that the accumulation of this fatty acid is now triggering us to be obese and metabolically unwell. Please tell me if I can elaborate and make more sense with that. And then we can get to the other question as well. And I can dig into that more. Well, I guess, yeah, what, well, I'm wondering with the white rice and sugar, if they were just in more of like a calorie deficit and that could have helped improve their insulin sensitivity. But um... I think they were, they, I mean, they're losing weight. So they have to be perhaps in some level of caloric deficit. I think that they probably had some degree of caloric deficit. I think it would be pretty hard. Although I don't know. I mean, with white rice, you could easily eat as many calories as you need. We could go back to Kempner studies and see. I don't think it was profound caloric deficit. It was just changing the macros for the majority of it. So I guess explain to like a fifth grader, what would cause diabetes? So diabetes, if you really look at the physiology, it starts in the fat cells. So historically, and I've talked about this on my social media, we would never have eaten the equivalent of five to seven tablespoons of corn oil 
five to seven tablespoons of soybean oil, five to seven tablespoons of canola oil, five to seven tablespoons of peanut oil, because to get any one of those amounts of these seed oils, you would have to eat enormous amounts of these things. To get five tablespoons of corn oil, you have to eat something like 65 years of corn, right? You have to eat two and a half or four pounds of soybeans. You have to eat two and a half pounds of sunflower seeds. You have to eat you know, like massive amounts of peanuts. You're not going to get this equivalent of linoleic acid on a daily basis without puking. And so we've given our body these evolutionarily inappropriate signals in the foods that we're eating. I think that most of your audience would understand if I said that historically, evolutionarily, I think homo sapiens were not eating this amount of corn. Historically, we've been eating animal fats, which are very low in linoleic acid. We've been eating um, animal organs. We've been eating fruit when it was seasonal, seeking honey if we were by the equator, et cetera. So there's a mismatch between the signals that we're giving our body, the accumulation of these fatty acids, and what's happening in our fat cells. That's probably not a fifth grade explanation. Let me try one more time. When you eat foods, <laughs> when you eat foods that your ancestors would never have eaten, they signal to your body that it's time to go into hibernation and you get fat and it's winter. So you focus more on seed oils. Now I think of, when I say sugar and carbs, I think of like two different groups. We've got like man-made sugars, Snickers bars. We've got the natural sugars, potato, fruit. And so I would have thought that your argument would have still been something along the lines of like even man-made chemically extracted sugar, or even just the added chemicals like red 40 and the other ingredients in that that are toxic maybe contribute to diabetes, but you're like, no, mainly just seed oils. I think that a lot of the things we've introduced into our food supply that humans have never been exposed to are harmful for humans. And I think that processed sugar is interesting if we want to talk about this. So naturally occurring sugars in foods are things like lactose, disaccharide of glucose and galactose, sucrose, which occurs naturally in many foods, which is a disaccharide of glucose and fructose. Um, those are the main ones that we come in contact with. So we have glucose, fructose, galactose are the main ones. If you're looking at the monosaccharides and they can make different disaccharides together. So you can get table sugar and that's extracted from a sugar cane. And you can also get high fructose corn syrup, which is made from corn. I think that the problems with high fructose corn syrup are probably in the processing. Uh, these are the, this is where the devil's in the details. It's There's evidence that at least up until recently, there were significant amounts of heavy metals in high fructose corn syrup. If you look at animal studies, which are never a perfect representation of a human trial, but they give us some clue. Rats do much worse on high fructose corn syrup than they do with plain sucrose. They gain more weight on calorie matched high fructose corn syrup than they do with sucrose. So what's going on there? Is it, is it hidden calories? Is it undigested starch that's not being accounted for? Who knows? So there's something about high fructose corn syrup that looks to be uniquely harmful for humans. I don't think anyone's fully pegged it down, but I think that we can make a pretty strong case that humans should not safely, cannot safely consume high fructose corn syrup. People would argue with that, but I think we could make a strong case against their, their rebuttals. Now, sucrose is interesting. If, if we look at table sugar, is table sugar harmful for humans? I think the table sugar primarily doesn't have much value because there's no micronutrients associated with it. And I don't think humans should be eating table sugar. I think if you're eating an orange, you're getting a lot of more information along with the sugar, quote unquote, in an orange. And there's definitely sucrose in an orange. You're getting vitamin C, you're getting hesperidin, you're getting naringenin, you're getting folate you know, you're getting magnesium. There's all sorts of things in an orange. So I don't consume pure sugar, but, and I think that there's also the possibility that in the processing of sugar cane, you're going to introduce problematic things into sucrose, whether it's heavy metals or things that use in the extraction. Seed oils as a mirroring point here are extracted from oils in industrial processes. And the problem is that that leaves the seed oils contaminated with things like benzene, which is a molecule that is strongly associated with cancer. I've seen a study showing that soybean oil has three parts per million of benzene, which is a known human carcinogen, and there's really no safe level of benzene. And seed oils also contain heavy metals from the processing, cadmium, lead, antimony, as well as uh, phthalates, which are these endocrine disrupting compounds that are used in fragrances like perfumes. And so all of these end up in seed oils. There's a potential that all of these are also ending up in processed sugar. So I'm not sure that processed sugar is great thing for humans in general. And I think most things that have added, quote, processed sugar, even if it's sucrose, are going to have other potential contaminants. But as a theoretical molecule, I don't think sucrose is harmful for humans. Um, but I think it's better to get that sucrose when you are with other, other micronutrients. So if, you know, I work with a lot of clients who 
if they have a little bit of something sweet, so I say, hey, have some blueberries, then a little bit of something sweet turns into a lot of bit of something sweet. So now they're like binge eating on chocolate chip cookies and cakes and pies. And so some sure. people I find that even if I say, hey, we're gonna stick with whole, real, natural, single ingredient foods, then they just can't handle even a little bit of something sweet. So how would you? Yeah. yeah. I talked about this a little bit with Anthony Chafee when he was on my podcast. So there's a couple of things that could be going on here. Two things. So when we don't eat carbohydrates or when we restrict carbohydrates, we do develop what's called physiologic insulin resistance. It's kind of like putting a car in a garage and then trying to start the car and drive the car at 60 miles an hour. It, it, you need to tune the car up. Your body's going to take about 72 hours to reinsert all the enzymes and transporters and channels into your cells if you suddenly start eating carbohydrates, if you haven't had carbohydrates for days, weeks, et cetera. So there is a transition period. I think a lot of people when they're low carb or zero carb and they start eating carbohydrates, they see a huge spike in blood sugar because, well, you're physiologically insulin resistant. Many people can do this faster than 72 hours, maybe 24, but 24 to 72 hour window for your body to say, oh, okay, this is what I'm doing. So I think you're right to suggest that your clients, if they want to try carbohydrates, do so gradually. I think that if there is a, if there's a psychological weakness there and they have these other junk foods in their house, they may have some sort of a reaction to what's going on there. I think that ultimately if people can get through the first phase of like your blood sugar is going to spike because you're physiologically insulin resistant, but your body will manage it, then they're going to have less blood sugar swings, which are going to cause less of this sort of sugar craving. The other thing I'll say is that sometimes, I mean, so I have a good friend and his dad was a low carb carnivore for a long time. And finally, after listening to me and after listening to other people, he started including more carbohydrates in his diet. I think now he has over 200 grams of carbohydrates, but he was sort of of the camp that if I eat carbohydrates, I can't stop eating carbohydrates. And I think we need to realize that part of the reason for that may be your body saying, thank God I'm getting carbohydrates. Like I just, I need more of these. This is an abundance signal. So when I was in Africa with the Hadza and they find a beehive, they don't just eat a little bit of it. They eat the whole beehive. They eat the whole beehive. So they're getting hundreds of grams of carbohydrates from honey. I think that sometimes we, there's two things going on here, right? There's eat the blueberries, eat a bunch of junk food, not a great thing. But then there's eat the blueberries, eat a whole thing of blueberries, which is, I think is fine, you know, because we say, okay, I ate the blueberries and then I ate a banana and then I ate some strawberries and then I ate some honey in my yogurt. I ate way too many carbohydrates. And I would say, I don't think you ate too many carbohydrates. Your body is just suddenly very happy to have carbohydrates. It's okay. I don't think that there is solid evidence to suggest that a postprandial insulin spike or even a postprandial glucose spike is harmful for humans long term. That's a normal thing. And again, these are like bad words in keto circles, like postprandial insulin. It's healthy, it's normal human physiology. You need insulin to rise after your meal to hold on to electrolytes, minerals at the level of the kidney most efficiently. And there are ways to spike your insulin after meals. If you're eating lots of protein without a lot of fat, that can be insulinogenic as well. But there's a much more efficient way to do it because for me and for many other people, as I found, if you're just eating fats and carbohydrates, if you're just eating fats and, and meat and organs, that's not enough of an insulin spike to hold on to the minerals properly. You really can't even eat enough salt to, to give your body the signals to hold on. You don't have enough insulin signaling after the after your meal at the level of the kidney. So getting insulin to rise after you eat is not the worst thing in the world. Your blood sugar goes to 140. It's not the end of the world. You're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. And so I think that for a lot of people, they, they start to eat the carbohydrates and they say, oh, I'm addicted to carbohydrates. And there's another possibility, which is just that, no, your body really likes the carbohydrates. You're not addicted. It's okay to eat the carbohydrates. You may eat the carbohydrates one day and think, I really want to eat carbohydrates now at every meal. Well, I would say that's great. <laughs> that's for, that's perfectly healthy, depending on the sources. You will not develop insulin resistance. You will not become obese. You will not have a problem with that. Your body will adjust, I would say, in positive ways. Your thyroid hormones will improve and other things will improve. But there is this notion that that's somehow bad. Does that make sense? Yes, though I have family who might watch this video and um, they are eating a standard American diet and so if I right. say, hey, you know, maybe you should have like a little bit less bread or a little bit less pasta, like that's carbohydrates. And so maybe they're hearing you say like, eat the carbohydrates, eat it, you know, and then they get confused. Like, which carbs are we talking about? Only fruit? Uh, good question. No, I appreciate the clarification. So when we look at carbohydrates for humans, I think that the, the most easily digested, least toxic form, forms of carbohydrates are fruit and honey and maybe maple syrup. These are, I would say, naturally occurring sources of quote, sugar. 
there are ways to get starches. I think that root vegetables, things like potatoes or sweet potatoes are kind of in the middle. Certainly there's precedent for humans eating roots in our evolution and hunter gatherers. But I think that most hunter gatherer tribes that I've been with, like the Hadza or read about in terms of anthropology texts, prefer fruit and honey over root vegetables. So they prefer simple sugars over starches. Once we get to the grains, things like oatmeal or pasta or bread, we're, we're, we're getting more complicated. And this actually is something that I still think is important to discuss, which is kind of a throwback to the strict carnivore days, which is that the seeds of plants are probably the most defended parts of plants. And people don't think about wheat as a seed. Oh, it's a grain. Well, any grain, any nut, any seed or any bean is actually a seed. If you plant them in the ground, they grow into a plant. That's a seed. We just classify them differently in terms of botany. But the seeds of plants are really full of defense chemicals and all sorts of things, whether it's oxalates, which are a compound in you know things like almonds and also spinach leaves, which are not a seed, but it's relevant to the conversation, uh, which can accumulate in different portions of the body, potentially causing kidney stones. Calcium oxalate kidney stones are the most time, common type of kidney stones. We know that eating more oxalates leads to calcium oxalate kidney stones. They're also full of things like digestive enzyme inhibitors. They're full of non-protein amino acids, which are kind of like these amino acids that don't work well in our protein structure. So normally there are amino acids that humans use. There are essential and non-essential amino acids. It's like our alphabet that we use to make proteins, but there are other letters in the alphabet in our environment. And if those letters of the alphabet get incorporated into our alphabet, we start building proteins, which are faulty. And that can lead, it's at least associated with neurodegeneration. There's not been much research on non-protein amino acids in probably 20 or 30 years, but I think it needs to be really looked at carefully, but non-protein amino acids occur in grains in, in higher amounts. And even in root vegetables, like beets are full of a non-protein amino acid called AZE. Alfalfa sprouts, uh, alfalfa sprouts are full of something called cannabinine, which is a well-known non-protein amino acid associated with lupus-like syndromes. So autoimmune issues from potentially protein misfolding. So non-protein amino acids are a potential problem in humans. They're common in grains. So digestive enzyme inhibitors, lectins, which are these carbohydrate binding proteins, which are potentially triggering to the gut in negative ways, negatively affecting goblet cells or mucus production at the lining of the gut. So grains, probably not great food for humans. Grains also have this problem of being sprayed with pesticides like glyphosate. So I think that, yeah, let's delineate between natural sources of carbohydrates. Let's call it fruit, honey, maple syrup, and maybe tubers. And then, and I mean, I guess you could say that I can't say that grains are an unnatural source of carbohydrates, but I think that grains are a very poor way for humans to get their carbohydrates. You won't die but I don't think it leads to optimal health in humans. I mean, I've done a whole thing on oats and oatmeal. They're full of saponins, which we know are very difficult to degrade and harmful for the gut. They're like a soapy substance and then phytic acid, which is only partially denatured when you cook it. I think at least 50 to 55% of the phytic acid, which is a large molecule that chelates minerals survives cooking. So when you eat oats, you're actually getting a negative mineral balance because minerals are being pulled out of your system. This is not opinion. This is scientific known fact. So yeah, things like oats and other grains, not great sources of carbohydrates for humans. Do you think that if someone was doing a zero carb diet that they might run into, yes, electrolyte issues, but they could just supplement with magnesium or supplement with some of the things that like, back to the people who might binge eat on the sugars, if they just stay away from sugar completely and they find that that helps them with managing their weight, then therefore it overall isn't improving their insulin since they're not going to be binge eating on more junk food. So then they find, okay, if I just do no sugar whatsoever, even fruit, even honey, then I need to get that spike. So maybe I eat more protein, but then I need to have some supplements like magnesium because I'm not getting it from the fruit. So yeah, a couple of things here. I think that more often than not, no matter how much magnesium, calcium, sodium you take, you don't hold on to it because you just don't get enough insulin spike. Maybe there are some outliers. Certainly in the carnivore community, there are people who claim to be outliers and claim to not have issues with this. But my experience and the experience with a lot of people that I've talked to is that you just, you can take all of the electrolyte supplement you want and you're just not going to retain it. You're going to have to eat a lot of protein to get a similar insulin signal. We know that carbohydrates are more insulinogenic than, than protein. It's simply, that's the way it is. From my experience, I also had electrolyte issues 
at about that year and a half mark. I never supplemented prior and I found that I had more eye twitching and muscle cramping. My husband had more heart palpitations. Honestly, my eye twitching was getting so bad that I was becoming embarrassed going out in public because I couldn't talk to people without my eye twitching. So I asked Dr. Saladino if people could fix this by just supplementing and he said no. Again, in my experience, I just started taking electrolytes. I started supplementing and the eye twitching and the muscle cramping went away. My husband's heart palpitations went away. So we do have a harder time holding on to electrolytes when we do lower carb as carbohydrates hydrate our cells. They keep us more hydrated, but if people don't do as many carbohydrates, I would consider looking into having electrolytes. The electrolytes that I've been using and that have helped me are called Element Electrolytes. Element has a science-backed ratio of sodium, magnesium, and potassium. I just take this packet, dump it into my water, mix it up, and I'm good to go. I usually do one packet a day, though there were times where I was doing two packets to help with my eye twitching, and other people I've seen do upwards of five packets a day. You can use the link in the description to get eight additional packets of Element free with your order, or you can get those eight additional free packets of Element by going to the URL drinkelement.com slash lilycane. I think that all of these discussions have to be framed in the context of thyroid and body temperature, which is... I think really important for both men and women. I, I think that they're, it's important to say, what is your thyroid doing, right? So my concern is that this example you give of someone who feels better, at least in some ways, or is made more able to maintain weight by eliminating all carbohydrates, I fear that their car, that their thyroid is, is suffering. And if you look at their free T3 or their total T3, it's not going to be within the reference range. And it's certainly not going to be in the middle of the reference range. If you check their body temperature, it's going to be low. The problem here is that it becomes, in the most respectful way, I'll say a race to the bottom because you limit calories or you limit carbohydrates and then your metabolic rate goes down. And you can see this with a low T3 and a lower body temperature. And then you have to go further down and then you go further down and you further down and people end up in these kind of wells of pretty depressed thyroid function and pretty low metabolic rates and you can maintain that in a zero carb state, but it's not optimal for humans. And then to get back out is a little bit challenging. I think that it would be very, very interesting and revealing to look at people in the keto space who I really appreciate and respect and check their body temperatures mm -hmm. and compare it to mine or someone else's and say, okay, um, let's just accept that if your body temperature is low, there's a possibility that your metabolic rate is lower than it could be. And if we look across species, it's pretty consistent that higher metabolic rates are associated with more longevity. A higher metabolic rate means that you are warmer, you have more energy, you're more, you, I guess like, it just means that your mitochondria are working better, you're doing oxidative phosphorylation more efficiently, you're doing glycolysis, you're using some glucose, you're using carbohydrates in your metabolism. The reverse is true when we limit carbohydrates as part of a survival adaptive mechanism. So I worry that though someone is trying to limit sugars, quote unquote, to lose weight, that they're handicapping themselves by not allowing their metabolism to be high. And so then what ends up happening is they'll exercise or they'll overexercise, and then you push your cortisol higher, you push your epinephrine higher, and you really end up in a well or a hole that is difficult to get back out of. I kind of want to push back a little bit on what you said about people who eat carnivore, their metabolism slows down and their body temperature becomes much colder. I would think it would be less so that they're eating a carnivore diet that's causing that issue and more so that they're just not eating enough. And if someone were to eat enough on carnivore, then they wouldn't have a slower metabolism or problems with hormones or thyroid function. I think that those problems happen from people under eating and that can be done on any kind of diet. So whether that's carnivore or a standard American diet, if someone significantly under eats, they may run into issues with their hormones, metabolism, thyroid function. And so I think that when people eat carnivore, they tend to be naturally very full off of the protein and fat that they naturally tend to under eat. And that might be a reason and an argument for having more carbs is carbs can make you hungrier to eat more to boost your metabolism. But I don't think that people would have to have carbs to do that, or they would have to not be carnivore to be able to have a high metabolism. What they would want to do is just make sure they're eating enough if they are going to eat more strict carnivore. Yeah. And I think that there's something to that. Um, 
I think that's why people lose weight originally, or one of the things that helps yeah. people lose weight originally on a carnivore diet. And I think that's something that- Because they're naturally lower calorie. Right. And, and you're eating a very nutrient rich food. Hopefully you're also getting organs in there to some extent. Um, so you're eating very nutrient rich foods that are not terribly high in calories, but I also think that you are then limiting your long-term maintenance of that weight loss and you're limiting your long-term ability to really be fully healthy. Are your hormones affected negatively when the thyroid declines as it will? I mean, you really can't eat in a 600 calorie deficit a day, even anywhere close to that. I mean, there's been studies of the Minnesota starvation experiment, I think is what it's called. And I forget exactly how many calories they went under. It was something maybe 300 to 600 calories a day deficit. These people were just, you, even with a 300 to 600 calorie per day deficit, you're not doing good long-term. You're not doing good. And so I think that if someone can't get enough calories eating carnivore, this is an indication that this is not the right way to eat for them at all. And including carbohydrates is not it's not as bad as people think it is. It's, there's plenty of evidence that it's not harmful for humans. And we can talk about why people think carbohydrates are, are harmful. We talked a little bit about it before. Um, my question for you is, do you know your free T3 in your total T3? Not off the top of my head, but it was in range. Now it was on the lower end of the normal range. I went over my blood work with Dr. Sabrina Solt and my zinc, selenium, and iodine were also all in range. Even though my selenium was in range, she said my selenium was the lowest of those three. So it would be my selenium that would need the most work to help with the T3, but it was still all in the normal range. Yeah, so I think that, so my hypothesis would be that if you had more carbs, that your thyroid would get better right? So low end of normal is not really where we want a free T3, but at least it's normal. When I was doing strict carnivore, my free T3 was, my my total T3 was not in the reference range at all. And I've seen so many people with free T3s, my labs from when I was a strict carnivore, my total T3 was also not in the reference range. So if you're in the reference range, that's great. I think if you had more carbohydrates, it would be even higher, which is, I would argue better. Do you check your body temperature? I'm like sweating right now talking to you. Um, Cause again, I think my metabolism is very strong because I eat so much more food than the average person who's eating like a very low carb diet. So that's where I think like you could eat a, a standard American diet and calorie restrict and run into metabolism issues and hormonal problems. Or you could be eating a carnivore low carb diet and be eating uh, calorie restricting and run into the same issues. So to me, it's more about like yeah. calories at that point. I think it's both. I think it's both. I think that that's both. I think carbohydrates are a signal for a lot of people. That, that's an important signal. You've got some, I'd be interested to see what your body temperature is. Like first thing in the morning when you wake up and document it okay. and then com compare it. Now it's going to change for a woman slightly around your cycle. There's like a little, like a half a degree bump at ovulation, but generally it's going to be pretty consistent for men. It should be consistent throughout the month. But I think this is something that if more people in the low carb space were doing, and you can check yeah. it under your tongue or axillary, there's a couple of adjustments, whether you do axillary or under the tongue, it would make the conversation more honest. Cause I think that what we're going to see is a lot of people in low carb space do have depressed, normal, well, depressed morning body temperatures. And I, I think that I certainly did uh, in the past when I measured it on carnivore, it was about a degree lower than it is now, sometimes more than that. So it's an indication of your metabolism. And I think we have to be really honest about these thyroids. And so then the question is, if you ate more carbohydrates and your thyroid comes up, is that a good thing or a bad thing, Lily? Right. Well, so I guess one of the reasons why I don't eat as many carbohydrates, and this might sound crazy, but like, I just like, don't know which ones to eat. And I get, okay, so this is a really good question. I think that people need to hear, but where I live, there's not access to like great fruit. It's moldy, it's rotten, it's hard, it's not good. Like we will be like looking at the bananas. They got like black all the way through the middle of them. We are full blown inspector gadgeting these fruits before we buy them. And we're like, okay, I think this one's good. And then we cut into it and it's not good. And then I get frozen fruit because I don't really have access to good fruit, but I have heard that frozen fruit is actually like the worst kind of fruit because they're putting all the ugly ones, the bad ones away because people can't tell because it's frozen. So anyway, that's where I would wonder for anybody who's like me, who's living in the Midwest, it's winter time right now. We don't have fresh local fruit. So it's like shipped yeah. from Timbuktu, you know? Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. Um... I think that humans live in interesting places all over the world for a variety of reasons. Our history is so fascinating. You know, we evolved at the equator and best estimates are that Homo sapiens left the equator around 60,000 years ago. Now there were other migrations from the equator with Neanderthals and Denisovans and other lineages of, of Homo, the Homo lineage, but Homo sapiens, maybe only last 60,000 years, they would leave the equator. So 
being in Costa Rica is interesting. Definitely being in a tropical place makes me think, oh, this is where humans are supposed to be. I don't really have to wear shirts very often. I don't, my house has air conditioning, but I don't use it because I live a little bit in the mountains above the ocean and I certainly never need the heat. And it's, wow, this is actually a really interesting climate. There's fruit that grows on trees outside of my house without much cultivation. I have oranges, I have star fruit, which I don't eat because potential oxalate issues. I have coconuts. And if I want, and I have bananas right outside my house, like there's fruit everywhere. You go to a farmer's market and there's all these local fruits that are here all year round. And so when people choose to move away from the equator, which oh, the majority of the human population has done, we have these supply chain issues. Now, I still think that humans can safely and healthfully eat fruit away from the equator. There are some arguments that it has to do with the amount of sun that you're getting, which is a whole separate conversation. But my impression is that in the States, so I was just in Texas and Arizona, and I saw grapes and apples. I couldn't find organic oranges. There were organic grapefruit, and there were pers persimmons. Can you get apples or pears or grapes where you are? Right now we have like great uh, pears as hard as rocks. Cause we like, we full blown, my husband does more fruit than I do. So he try, he, he's more like on your trying to do more fruit, but he will find like, yeah. he runs into more like gout like feet issues with more fruit, but he does probably 150 to carbs. But again, most of that coming from milk because we're like, I feel like milk's like our safest carbohydrate, at least for us where we have access to milk and yogurt from our local farmer. Whereas like our fruit, like we're trying, he'll, he'll do the bananas. I find bananas make me have like a puff of your face. So like just for aesthetic purposes, I don't want to have bananas, but I also find sometimes if I have too much sugar, I'll get dandruff. Interesting. Interesting. Now, what about honey? <laughs> So he like, most people like the taste of honey. I don't like the taste. So I'll like mix it in with yogurt if I have to, but otherwise like just pure honey kind of like grosses me out. <laughs> okay. I think honey is another option. I mean, maple syrup, honey. I mean, there's studies on both of them. I mean, honey in diabetics is interesting. There's human studies with honey showing that it potentially improves insulin sensitivity, which sounds crazy, but you know, fasting glucose lower after eight weeks of up to, I think 125 or 150 grams of honey, that's 10 tablespoons of honey a day in diabetics. Um, and so I think honey is a great option for people. Again, there's more micronutrients in like an orange than there are in honey, but some combination of those that people wanted to include more carbohydrates just to check basal body temperature, check thyroid labs. And then I think that it's so interesting because, you know, when I was strictly carnivore, I probably had, oh, who knows, eight to 15 grams of salt per day, maybe more. And now I just, it's, I eat a fraction of that, you know, I'll salt. I have two, two reasonably sized burgers a day for my meat. And those burgers are often mix a mix of liver and heart and, and meat and muscle meat. Um, and I'll salt the burgers, but that's the only thing I salt. And I don't, I don't get muscle cramps. I don't get palpitations. I don't have any electrolyte issues. It's just, it's so noticeable when you have carbohydrates, how much better you're able to manage electrolytes as a human. Is there such thing as too much fruit for you? Like, is there a cap on like, yeah, if you're doing like 20 pieces a day, that's probably too much. Or is it like, no, as, many, as much as your body's asking for? I think, that, well, that'd be, that's a good question. I mean, I think that if your body is asking for it, I don't see a problem with you eating more of it. Obviously there's maybe some feedback for some people, uh, you know, that, some people are going to react to different fruits, even within these foods, some people have sensitivities, right? So I think that fruit is the part of the plant that plants want you to eat. It's colorful. It should be ripe. Even some people are more sensitive than others to different fruits. Sometimes when I go to the States, I'll eat, I don't know, I'm trying to think of a fruit that I don't particularly love. I don't love grapefruit. It just doesn't really seem to agree with me. I don't feel as good when I eat grapefruit, potentially because of compounds in grapefruit that affect um, phase one detoxification enzymes, but not everybody does great with all fruit. I'm actually not a huge fan of raspberries and blackberries. They, they do have a significant amount of oxalates around the seeds. Kiwis have oxalates around the seeds, unless you cut the seeds out of a kiwi, which doesn't leave much of the kiwi. Yeah. So who knows how much those oxalates are absorbed, but it's interesting because the fruit that contains a lot of seeds can be more problematic for people. So blueberries are pretty benign. I don't have a problem, but the blackberries, the raspberries, I don't end up doing a lot of that because they're pretty expensive. And I do think that they, I just don't like them as much. It's hard to get a decent amount of carbohydrates in those. I like oranges. I'm not a huge fan of bananas, to tell you the truth. We have plantains in Costa Rica. I'll eat them sometimes, but I'm not a huge fan. I end up eating a lot of watermelon. I make watermelon juice. I love fruit juice, especially when I make it. Again, something that really triggers people in low carb communities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so. 
that's where it's like, I guess it gets hard again because like I think about like our grandparents, like even a hundred years ago, for them to eat an orange, we would have to eat seven oranges today to get that same amount of micronutrients and vitamin C and magnesium and potassium from an orange. A hundred years ago today, we'd have to eat seven of them. I don't know if you have pushback on that, but then I think about how like for me to get fruit from my grocery store, it's like, it says it's shipped from Mexico. It's shipped from other countries. I know they're pick. it says pack date six weeks ago. So it's like I'm eating old, picked early, picked before ripe, sprayed with the, the glyphosate, pesticides, things you were talking about with the grains. That's happening with the, the fruits as well. I mean, I just make sure to skin all of my fruit, but. Yeah, maybe organic. You ever try? I mean, I don't love starch. I've experimented with it, but you ever experiment with starch? Yeah, yeah. I like potatoes. I can't, I can only do so many sweet potatoes because I think I overdid it with, like you're mentioning oxalates with um, uh, spinach. I was a religious spinach eater. So my knees, I have yeah. a lot of joint pain. I blamed on track and field for eight years, but I think it's oxalates. So I love sweet potatoes. I love potatoes and we'll do it sometimes. But again, it goes kind of to like, I have this dandruff thing that I've been trying to figure out for like a long time. And it seems that when I have more carbohydrates, I have more dandruff. And I don't know, maybe you're thinking um, that's um, make-believe and it's more related. I to don't just... think it's make-believe. No, I think there's clearly an autoimmune thing there. I think having an autoimmune condition can be a, a blessing as much as it is a challenge. I mean, my eczema is very sensitive to foods. And, and I know that like, I mean, I have friends who say when I do, even they say whenever I do raw cow's milk, I get acne. And I think, okay, maybe you're just not agreeing with that. that for whatever reason, even within these foods, there are some people that are more sensitive than others. So no, I think the dandruff is a real thing. And if, if the root vegetables give you dandruff or a certain fruits give you dandruff, it's probably not a great fit for you immunologically. It doesn't mean that all fruit or all roots are bad, but I don't feel as good with starches. I just don't digest them as well. I've tried potatoes. When I think about white rice, I... I think, well, it still has a significant amount of arsenic. There's non-protein amino acids in rice, like we talked about earlier. Um, it's just, I just, yeah, it's rice is rice is kind of a tough one for me. It's just, it's significant. There's heavy metals. Although rice tends to digest pretty well for me. I don't, I don't know. I, I think that the fruits work well for me because they have more micronutrients. And as I said, my thyroid hormones look better, my basal body temperature is better, my performance is better, and I don't see any negative effects with these. Now, let's just for a moment, talk about why people say fruit is bad. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So um, I think the problem with fructose specifically is that most of the studies people are looking at are animal studies. And when animals are given free fructose, free fructose doesn't absorb as well as fructose along with glucose. So if you get free fructose floating around in the gut, it will not be absorbed. And that triggers all sorts of immune reactions. It can trigger increased levels of endotoxin, which is when you get that, you get all sorts of negative things. So a lot of the trials that have been done in animals with fructose either use massive amounts or free fructose, which doesn't approximate what humans ever really get without some glucose along with it. There's no source of free fructose without any glucose on the planet that humans are going to get. So that's important to consider. And even with human feeding trials, if we're giving free fructose or pure fructose, or we're giving fructose intravenously, we cannot approximate that with fruit. So when you look at the whole of the literature or even individual studies in humans, I mean, fruit looks to be pretty darn healthy. Uh, orange juice improves endothelial function, lowers levels of oxidized LDL, attenuates many oxidative stress cascades. And so there's a lot of benefits to fruit. Honey possibly improves diabetes or at least improves insulin sensitivity if we're using fruit, fasting glucose as a metric. Um, maple syrup probably has benefits. Maple syrup contains a lot of micronutrients people aren't aware of, manganese, other things like that. So the literature in humans is, it's hard to find something where you can say whole fruit or even fruit juice is bad, um, unless you're looking at sort of elaborate in inaccurate constructs or animal models where they're really stressing the heck out of the animals. Uh, are you aware of any, anything that would contradict that statement? I am just thinking more about like liver enzymes. I'm thinking about like Mary Ruddock and a lot of the people mainly have an issue with the fructose on being related to fatty liver disease. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's really no good evidence that fruit contributes to fatty liver disease at all. And what else are you doing? Right? Like every individual human, it's like, there's it's multifactorial, right? Yeah. What else is Mary Ruddock eating or taking or being exposed to? Like, there's a lot of things there, but if you look at the literature, there's really, it's not, it's very, it's very clear that like fructose in the form of fruit and natural sugars doesn't do anything in terms of fatty liver, potentially improves it. Okay, cool. If you could just pick, like, let's say I'm a 40 year old woman who's trying to lose weight. What is, would be a day of eating that you would recommend for a woman? Let's say she's five foot four, currently 160 pounds, probably wants to be more like 130. So she has 30 pounds to lose. What would a day of eating look like for her? 
Uh, it depends what she's eating now in some ways, but ideally just improve the overall food quality. I think that if you can start with macros, which is a good place to start, and then you can drill down to the micronutrients and the individual foods. I think that for somebody for weight loss, you probably want to approximate about 0.8 grams of protein per per goal body weight. So 1.8 to 1 grams of protein. So she's going to need around 100 grams of protein at, at least. I do think that getting enough high quality protein is critical, but 0.8 grams per pound of you know, goal body weight is pretty darn good for most people. So 100 to 130 grams of protein per day, which is going to end up being about a pound of meat, give or take. If she's including raw dairy, you could drop that down a little bit. And the carbohydrates, I think that, you know, depending how insulin resistant she is and how her activity level, you're going to want to start with at least 100 grams in a day and titrate up for more activity, but not go below that with honest metrics like basal body temperature and free T3, total T3 as as really hard metrics to give you a sense of where your metabolic rate is short of actually doing a study of your metabolic rate, which isn't really functional for most people in terms of fat. I think she can be anywhere from, I would say 25 to 35, maybe even 40% of her calories from fat. But I think for most people, again, going down on fat too much is going to cause issues. But if you do less fat, it's going to lead to more weight loss. This is something we've known. You can limit carbohydrates or you can limit fat and you'll get weight loss. My issue is that if you limit carbohydrates, you have other problems in terms of the thyroid and other things that we talked about. So I think limiting fat is a, is a reasonable strategy. And this is in contradistinction to the ketogenic movement, which says eat as much fat as you want, right? So I think that she needs to have, let's say 30% calories from fat, even maybe even 25% calories from fat, about 100 to 150 grams of carbohydrates based on her activity level, and then 100 to 130 grams of protein. So you're going to be looking at around a pound of meat, maybe some raw dairy, a couple pieces of fruit, maybe some honey and some organs in there, either fresh or desiccated. I mean, she can throw in some eggs if she wants. You can do fish, but there's heavy metals in there. Obviously I would do the best sources of meat that you can. And that's a good thing. If she wants to do tubers for carbohydrates, I'm fine with that, just how she reacts and how she feels with that. But I think hitting those macros with that set of foods. I mean, I think of an animal-based diet now just as a term that helps people understand what sort of a dietary framework we're talking about. And that's organs, meat, fruit, honey, and raw dairy. And so you can kind of select from that list to fill in those things for those carbohydrates. Do you want more detail or is that helpful? I think that's good. You mentioned organs. A lot of people are grossed out by organs. They don't want to make them. I love them. I think they're delicious. Um, but where can people get desiccated organs? Yeah. I mean, I built a company called Heart and Soil because my mom and my sister would never eat organs. And so you can find heart and soil if you want some desiccated organs. It's just, it's really cool to see how people benefit from organs, whether they're fresh or desiccated. The cool thing about desiccation, it's actually not the correct term. It's freeze drying is that you take the organ and it's a grass fed, grass finished organ from New Zealand. Some of the best farms I've ever seen on the planet on New Zealand and Australia, they're the most amazing places for agriculture. I mean, the way that cows are raised in New Zealand and Australia is, is like 30 years ahead of us. It's it's an incredible technology for raising cows there. It's the greenest grass, the healthiest cows I've ever seen. It's real regenerative agriculture. So you source the organs from there and then you put them in a freeze dryer, which lowers the pressure. And then you can basically take the water out of them below freezing, which preserves as many of the nutrients as possible. So you're getting organs in a capsule. Fresh organs are ideal, but it's pretty darn great. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty convenient. Perfect. Well... That's all my questions. Oh, well, I mean, I'm curious about your own personal life. I'm like, well, how much fat are you doing nowadays? Because I know, like, I thought I saw something where it's like, Paul's eating only 80 grams of fat a day. I mean, I could look at my chronometer. Oh, you use chronometer too. Okay, me too. I do occasionally, yeah. I mean, I think it's it's on the lower end now. I kind of play around with the macros these days. I would say I'm probably around 25% of my calories from fat. How many calories do you about think you're doing? About 3,500 a day. So a quarter oh, of those from you're, fat. You're, wow, you're crushing it. Awesome. What do you mean in terms of calories? Yeah, well, so like I said, my husband's more in like the bodybuilding kind of world, but he ended up doing more carnivore because of gut issues and saw a lot of improvement. But like you said, he tracks his sleep, his sleep got worse, his, um, well, mainly just sleep, I think. Energy, less, oh, and he lost so much muscle. Lost tons of muscle, couldn't eat enough food, so his metabolism yeah. was obviously going down. But then, um, so now he's been incorporating more and more and more and more and more. So I think he's like 150 grams of carbs, but um, uh -huh. he still can't get his calories up. Like we keep feeding him more and more and more, We're like keep eating, keep eating, and he can't put on the same muscle anymore as he used to in the past. He's five foot ten. I think he's 160 right now. He used to be 175 and more carbs. 400. He's like, I feel like I'm eating so much fruit. 
So that's the thing. And that's where eating fruit juice is helpful. Um, yeah. I mean, cause the fiber gets in the way, honey. Yeah. I mean, you can do 400. If he's, if he's that active, I, you're not going to see a decline in his insulin sensitivity. I mean, you give him 400 grams of carbs. That's I'm often at 400 grams of carbs a day. So I think I'm probably, if, if I'm doing 3,500 calories a day and I'm getting 25 to 30% of my calories from fat, then I'm more than 80, but not a ton more than 80 grams of fat. I might be at a hundred because that would be 900 calories a day, 100, 110 grams of fat a day. But I think that that's probably a little low for me. I think I probably need to pump it up a little bit just so that I have more satiety. So sometimes I add a little bit of butter. I end up eating a lot of heart these days, which is kind of lean. And then the fat from goat's milk, goat's milk isn't that fatty. So I'm not eating a ton of fat anymore. It's definitely lower because if you play with your macros and you know I have more carbohydrates, about the same amount of protein, I'm aiming for about 0.8 grams per pound. Like I said, I'm 165 pounds. So I don't, I don't need a whole lot of protein. I get a ton of pro I eat a lot of goat's milk these days. And then, yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, well, we, I haven't had heart in a long time, but heart tastes like steak to me. We need to get some heart now that you keep mentioning heart. I'm like, oh yeah, I forget that's a thing. I would just keep you doing liver. Yeah. Yeah. Liver's great. I think liver is like this multivitamin. You only eat a little bit, you know, half an ounce a day, but Heart, heart is great. Um, I, I always feel conflicted about heart because there's only one heart per animal. And so the more I talk about heart, the more difficult it's going to be to get heart. But I just, I, I just don't want to see hearts going to waste. And so if people are eating heart, that makes me happy. And it's great. I, I want people to eat more organs. I think heart and liver are the easiest to, but of those, I eat, I eat way more heart than I do liver. Cause I'm only eating like half an ounce of liver a day. And then I'm eating significant amounts of heart right now. And heart is great. So let's just talk about heart for a moment. Heart is amazing. It has a significant amount of riboflavin. So I love chronometer and you can put all of your food into chronometer. And I've shown this on my podcast, which is just called the Paul Saladino MD podcast. And I go through my chronometer for a day of eating, which is pretty consistent for me right now. And uh, you can see the nutrients you're getting. It's not perfect. It doesn't have everything on there, but it has a lot. And it's interesting to see what the riboflavin level is. I don't think people, enough people are getting enough riboflavin, but there's really interesting research that if you get more than the RDA for riboflavin. I think the RDA for riboflavin, don't quote me, is around one to two milligrams a day. If you get more than that, it actually has some sort of an allosteric effect on your MTHFR and helps kind of rescue the sluggish MTHFR for people that have polymorphisms. And so where do you get riboflavin? I think it's a critical thing in most people's diets. There's really not much riboflavin in plant foods. Hmm. You're not going to get two milligrams of riboflavin a day. I can get six milligrams of riboflavin a day when I eat heart uh, it's crazy. Just from my foods, I can get six milligrams of riboflavin a day. There's a little bit in in, um, in goat's milk, but riboflavin predominantly occurs in animal foods and there's not much in muscle meat. There's a fraction in muscle meat. Even eating a pound or two pounds of muscle meat a day, you're only getting, I'm estimating here off the top of my head, I would say 0.7 milligrams of riboflavin. So you'd have to eat so much meat to get enough riboflavin, but you add organs, liver, or especially heart are very rich in riboflavin, which can help with this polymorphism and other things. So the B vitamins, there's like unique B vitamins in, in heart. And then heart is also a good source of coenzyme Q10, good source of taurine, this unique amino acid type compound that occurs only in animal foods. It's been studied across species and found to promote longevity. So heart is a great thing. Um, now that you guys all heard that, share heart with your neighbors. Don't everybody go out and buy all the heart everywhere, but I want the heart to get eaten. So don't ever right. waste a heart. <laughs> when, I, when I log my chronometer, the thing I'm, I'm usually always low in is vitamin E. E. Well, this is a, there, there are problems with chronometer. It'll also tell you you're low in vitamin K, yeah. um, if you, which is crazy because it's not, chronometer doesn't account for vitamin K2. It's not in the USDA database. It's only looking at vitamin K1. And I, I am so confident that animal fat is rich in vitamin E and that it is not something that you see on the USDA database because I've done multiple blood tests for vitamin E when I was carnivore, when I'm animal-based and I'm above the reference range for vitamin E. But you know, if you listen to Rhonda Patrick on Joe Rogan a number of years ago, when she talks about carnivore diet, she says, where do they get their vitamin E? Because traditionally we only think in terms of the USDA database and you think, oh, vitamin E is only in nuts and seeds or oils. Well, it, the reason it's in those things is to protect those fragile polyunsaturated fats, which will oxidize and kill the plant. Otherwise, so you don't need to get your vitamin E there. There's plenty of vitamin E in animal fat just because it's a fat soluble vitamin. So butter, tallow, ghee, um, these are all, I think, very underrepresented sources of vitamin E, the full spectrum of tocopherols and vitamin K2. Cool. That makes me like peace of mind right there. Cause those are like the only two that I tend to be lower. And of course, if I, I mean, I do eat fruit every day, but if I ever were to not, then I'd be low in folate, but. The folate is an issue for people though. If you're not eating fruit, um, 
or liver uh, or egg yolks. So yeah, folate can be low in, in some people. And that's an important one. I mean, you, you definitely want enough folate. It's, it's something you see consistently in the, if you look at the labs of people who are just eating meat, their folate is almost always low. It's, it's below the reference range, which I don't think is a good thing for humans. I mean, especially women who want to become pregnant. There's a lot of concerns with folate regarding neural tube development, pregnancy, breastfeeding, even for men for fertility, like you, you got to get folate from somewhere. And yeah, I mean, if you look at my chronometer, I think the folate comes from liver and it comes from fruit. Yeah. I don't want to be low in anything, even if like, whether it's full, I mean, people will argue. I mean, I think vitamin C people argue about, but otherwise yeah, I don't want to be low in anything. No, I mean, I think, I think it's good to get enough vitamin C. You easily get it when you add some fruit to your diet. Easy. You don't it's so fruit. easy. Yeah. You don't even have to worry about it if you just add some fruit to your diet. So. All right. Again, I think Dr. Saladino is a great guy. We agree on a lot of things. There's some small things we disagree on, but one of the bigger things though, that Dr. Saladino said that I just want to throw out there was when he refers to honey, maybe being helpful for people with diabetes. And he quotes a study where participants are given 10 tablespoons of honey a day and their diabetes and insulin sensitivity improves. Now, whether or not sugar is good or bad for diabetes, regardless, if we take what someone is currently eating and we add 10 tablespoons, spoons of honey on top of that, if the person doesn't increase their activity level and exercise more, this person's just adding more calories, they will likely gain more fat and therefore not improve their insulin sensitivity. So for these participants in this study, if their diabetes and insulin sensitivity improved, therefore they would have had to take what they were currently eating and eat less of that to then add in the 10 tablespoons of honey a day to lose weight and to improve their insulin sensitivity. I'm assuming with these participants, they were eating more calories and more sugar prior to the study that now when yes they're having 10 tablespoons of honey a day they're improving their insulin sensitivity and diabetes because they're just overall having less food less calories less sugar than they were previously we also don't know if these participants are now exercising more or if this study was funded by like a sugar company or something so i just want to put it out there so that way people aren't just thinking that the more and more honey they have the faster their diabetes is going to improve I I mean, maybe it does. You can just try it for yourself and see, but I just wanted to put it out there because I you know, don't want people being led astray and thinking that they should take what they're currently eating and add 10 tablespoons of honey a day to improve their diabetes. You can follow Dr. Saladino on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube at Paul Saladino MD, and you can follow along his podcast at the Paul Saladino MD podcast. Don't be silly, subscribe to Lily, and I'll see you in the next one.